Hello and welcome back to the Chronicles of Aguna, the Arsenal podcast brought to you by the last a man standing with Loserport.com. As ever, I am your host, Harry Simu, and on this edition, we'll be looking back at that 1-1 draw up at Old Trafford and we'll be getting the thoughts of former Arsenal striker Jeremy Aliadier. We talk about uh, the game last night and we talk about uh, how he thinks Arsenal have progressed under Unai Emery. So stay tuned, that's coming up in part two. But first of all, I'm going to give you my thoughts Um on the game up at Old Trafford. And I guess I I want to start off by saying that there's a real feeling of disappointment. And under normal circumstances, you go to Old Trafford, you come away with a point, you know, I'd be pleased. But it just feels like it's an opportunity missed because this Manchester United team are so poor. I mean, I looked at their lineup before the game and there wasn't a single player in there that sort of struck fear into me. There wasn't a player in there that I looked at and thought, my God, he's real top quality. He's going to be a handful. He's someone that we have to watch. It just feels like having gone from this game sort of being a potential title decider between two of the you know, the biggest clubs in this country, still two of the biggest clubs in this country, that hasn't changed. But in terms of the quality and the levels that we're both at, you know, there's been a real, real decline. And, um, you know, it's not disappointing to see United uh, obviously fall from grace because, you know, that rivalry is a very heated one and I was growing up in the heat of it. So for me, you know, I'd go as far as saying I hate Manchester United as much as I hate Tottenham. Um, I can hand on my heart say that as an Arsenal fan. And, you know, it, it is a game that means so much to me. But, you know, the fact that Sky Sports spent the entire build up pretty much talking about the the battles of yesteryear and and about the you know the great rivalry in the past just tells you everything you need to know about this game it wasn't a game that many neutrals were looking forward to in terms of the overall quality of the match it was poor uh, from start to finish there was nothing to rant and rave about there was no real moments of top quality maybe Pierre Emerick Aubameyang's finish us about it um, but yeah very underwhelming very underwhelming and you know first of all the fact that it was a Monday night was Uh, I think an absolute disgrace because I've spoken to numerous people who made the journey up to Old Trafford. There was a problem on the M6 on the way back. Some of them didn't get back till three, four o'clock this morning, many of which I'm sure had to go to work as well. Um, Very selfish of the Premier League to move this game to a Monday night, in my opinion, when there was only one Super Sunday game. It just didn't make sense. This, in my opinion, should have been the Sunday four o'clock. Um, but, you know, the powers that be decided that it will be played on a Monday. And for me, that's really, really disappointing and a sign of where modern football has gone. Now, let's start off with Unai Emery's initial team selection. My thoughts on it uh, are pretty simple, really. I didn't expect Rob Holding to start the game. I probably maybe would have pushed him uh, into the starting eleven just because I feel like, you know, we are so weak in that area that any change will, will make a difference. But... Having said that, I didn't think Socrates and Lewis were all that bad yesterday. And I get why somebody like Rob Holding wasn't risked. You know, he's been out for a very, very long time. The last thing we need is a setback. Um, And, you know, I can't really take issue with the manager in that sense. Because whilst I question a lot of his decisions, I think that, you know, you, you don't mind Rob Holding missing this game if it means that his recovery can be managed correctly and we'll have him for the rest of the season. If you're going to rush players back, there's, of course, a risk of a setback. And that is the last thing we need because our defence is in dire straits. Um, So I totally get why he did that. He went with Leno in goal. The back four was Chambers, who I thought warranted a place. Um, I think at times he's been a little bit suspect defensively at right back. But I think Ainsley Maitland-Niles' confidence is so low at the moment. Um, He's been making mistakes left, right and centre. Some fans have been getting on his back. I think it was the right thing to do to bring Callum Chambers back in. And Callum Chambers, surprisingly, has been quite competent getting forward. Um, He's made a lot more forward runs than I thought he would, uh, given that he's a player who traditionally splits his time between right back and centre back. I maybe thought he'd be a little bit more defensive minded, but he has gotten forward um, to help the team in, in the attacking sense. I was a little bit worried, actually, when he picked up that early yellow card because I thought, you know, that would be a real handicap for him. But credit to to Callum Chambers. He managed that really, really well. So going back to the back four, Chambers, Socrates, Lewis and Kalas in action. Now, many people question the decision, um, you know, why Kieran Tierney wasn't there. But Kieran Tierney, obviously, um, 
you know, isn't ready. And again, I trust the club's judgment on that. Uh, we don't know how they get on in training. We don't know what the advice uh, is from the physios and, and those managing his recovery. So again, I'm okay with that. Haven't really got an issue uh, with those players being left behind. That's for sure. Um, so that was the back four. Uh, moving into the midfield, he went with that trio again of Xhaka, Genduzi, Torreira. Now, for me, it's a little bit negative. It's a little bit... I get where he's coming from. He wants hard work. He wants the ability to press. He feels that it will solid up the team a little bit. But for me, that is a midfield that is quite clearly lacking in creativity. A midfield that's probably incapable of keeping possession for any long period of time. And I think the stats, particularly in the first half, showed that. Um, I just... I just think that that midfield is something that he tried against Spurs, didn't he, in, in, in one of the halves. It quite clearly didn't work. But Unai Emery obviously believes in it because he's tried to do it again. And I get that Genduzi and Torreira allow you to press uh, Xhaka not so much. But the problem is that when they're pressing, they have to be disciplined in their pressing. And it's about pressing in the right areas. And for me, you know, Matteo Genduzi had a good game again last night. He was everywhere, all over the pitch, doesn't hide. Um, you can never... You can never criticise him for, you know, standing up and taking responsibility because he certainly does that. But I thought that at times him and Torreira, more so Torreira, their discipline wasn't there in terms of pressing in the right areas. And often when they press too far up the pitch and, and United beat the press, which, you know, most teams will at some stage in a game, it left us exposed again. And it left us in a position where our midfielder backtracking Granit Xhaka is exposed again. Um, not the most mobile player. We've spoken about that over and over again on this podcast. But I just feel like it leaves us vulnerable when the pressing is too intense, if that makes sense. And when I say too intense, I don't mean that, you know, they do it with too much energy or too much pace. I mean, they do it maybe in areas where they should just allow the opposition to have the ball. I thought that the three ahead of them, Saka, Aubameyang and Pepe, you know, I thought Saka was the, the bright light again. Uh, showed that he's not out of his depth at this level. Really promising young player. Nicola Pepe, on the other hand, had a really, really poor game. And, I, you know, it was a couple of weeks ago, I think, where I pulled up Nicola Pepe's performances on this podcast. And there was a load of comments saying that I'm negative and that I'm digging him out. I'm not digging him out um, because I want to have a go at him or I want to make fun of him. I want Nicolas Pepe to flourish at Arsenal, as does everybody else. But the truth is, and the reality is, that up to now, he's not shown us um, the quality that, you know, we thought we were getting. Now, I know there's an embedding period. I know it takes time for a player when they come from overseas to settle. And so I'm not going to be standing there saying Pepe out or what a fucking waste of money just yet. Um, but his performances really, really do need to improve, in my opinion. I think, you know, that is the common consensus. I, I can't believe there's Arsenal fans out there who will sit there and say that Pepe is doing absolutely fine because he seems to me like somebody who's not confident in his own ability at the moment. He he gets the ball in one-on-one -on -one situations and you want to see him take the man on, beat his man, get a cross in or, or beat his man and get a shot at goal. But it feels like Nicola Pepe's confidence is a little bit shot, like he's not quite got that bit between his teeth at the moment. And I thought that the goal... Uh, against Villa when Aubameyang gave him the penalty would have maybe given him that kick up the arse but it seemingly hasn't I get it there are far easier games in the Premier League than going to Old Trafford and so you know we will judge him over the course of the season but I think there is a, there is a genuine concern there and I think it's fair to have that concern uh, at this moment in time and then Aubameyang of course um, you know Aubameyang does what Aubameyang does maybe not as involved in the game as we'd like, uh, you know, when Arsenal are in possession of the ball or maybe not in possession of the ball. Uh, but ultimately, Pierre-Emerick Aubameyang had one opportunity last night and he took it. And I believe, if I'm not mistaken, I'm throwing this stat off the top of my head now, that's 49 goals in 73 appearances. That is an incredible statistic. And Pierre-Emerick Aubameyang is a world-class striker. There's no two ways about it. He's fantastic and at times... I dread to think where Arsenal would be at the moment if we didn't have that quality up front because, you know, the rest of the team is, is fairly average. Um, just looking at my notes, because I, I do like to, to make the odd note during the game, I thought the overall approach was a little bit cowardly in the sense that 
you know, you, you can't be too critical because we got the draw. And when you look at the league table now, you know, what, seven games in, I think we're, we're in fourth place, which is where we really should be. Um, we've been to Anfield, we've been to Old Trafford and we've played Spurs. So it's not disastrous by any means in terms of the results. But I still feel like we're lacking a plan. I still feel like we're a little bit cowardly at times, that we're a little bit too conservative in a game that probably we could have won had we maybe gone for the jugular, maybe up the intensity at certain times and really taken the game to United from the off. I think we would have pinned them back. I think their confidence is really low and you can shatter it early doors if you get get into the game early, if you get in their faces, if you play with pace, with power, with precision. And I just think that's still lacking from this Arsenal side. So, um, you know, it's not the way I would have approached the game, but, you know, we got a draw at Old Trafford, so I'm not going to go to town on the manager uh, this week anyway. Um, talking about the goals, lots of people uh, are picking on Granit Xhaka in regards to Manchester United's goal. Um, I think the more concerning thing and the more alarming thing is that that stemmed from Arsenal having a corner. Arsenal have a corner, Everybody's chasing back. Xhaka was one of the first players back in his defence. Um, that's why he's in the box and he's not the one going out to press. I've seen some people saying, why is he not pressing McTominay? Well, he was the first one back. So naturally, he's going to be the deepest player. But for me, to blame Granit Xhaka there and to say that he's put his head down on purpose to duck the ball is absolutely ridiculous. I think when a ball is struck with that much pace, with that much venom, anything you do is instinct. Anything you do is uh, a, is reactionary. There is no time to think. Add to that, it's taken a deflection off Socrates, which has completely changed the trajectory of the ball. You know, if 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 the ball uh, doesn't take that nick off Socrates, it probably goes straight into Granit Xhaka's head, and that's why he's put it down. But people are talking about him closing his eyes, trying to avoid the contact bottle in it. I think it's absolute nonsense, and it's nothing more. Uh, then in most cases, Arsenal fans fueling their agenda against Granit Xhaka. Is he perfect? No. Was he terrible last night? No, I don't think so. Uh, was he any worse than anybody else? No, I don't think so. Is he the best Arsenal captain ever? Absolutely not. But to blame him for that, I think is just silly. And I think people just need to put their agendas aside, put it to bed, judge the incident for what it is. You know, if you see a goalkeeper failing to readjust because of a deflection, nobody says anything. So why is it any different when we're talking about a midfield player? I don't know. Let me know your thoughts in the comments. Uh, I know it's a debate and a topic that has split the fan base. But for me, to blame Granit Xhaka is silly there. Um, Arsenal, of course, equalised through Pierre-Emerick Aubameyang in the second half. Had a couple of really good chances after as well to, to put the game to bed. We didn't. But I mean, you know, notoriously when you go to Old Trafford, you're playing against the referee and you're playing against Manchester United. And I've said that for years. People may say I'm biased because I'm an Arsenal fan, but there was a prime case of that again. Because how on earth has that linesman, you know, put his flag up there for Pierre-Emerick Aubameyang? Harry Maguire is standing right in front of him, right in front of him. That is as bad an offside decision as I've ever seen. And that referee, in my opinion, should be demoted from the Premier League. Because they've got VAR to hide behind now. And thank God they've got VAR. Because if they didn't, we're coming away from that game robbed and furious and pissed off. Like we have been many times at Old Trafford. But just imagine that VAR wasn't uh, in use last night. That would have been an absolute shambolic decision. Which would have cost Arsenal a point. And, uh, and could have made a huge uh, difference in our chase for the top four. So... You know, I'm thankful that VAR's there. You could argue Man United maybe should have had a penalty as well when the ball came off Kalasinac's hand. Um, I've seen it a couple of times. I'd have appealed for it at the other end. Um, but ultimately, VAR's improved it by 50% because it's got one of the decisions correctly. Uh, one of the decisions correct, sorry. So that is an improvement. Maybe not enough of an improvement in many people's eyes, but thank God it was there uh, for us last night. Uh, we've spoken about Nicola Pepe already, so I'm not going to go over that again. Um, let's talk about Reese Nelson. Reese Nelson came on as a sub. And for me, I I'm constantly having this argument with people. But for me, Bukayo Saka is ahead of Reese Nelson. Reese Nelson isn't ready to play in the Arsenal first team. He's not shown any signs of it, in my opinion. He's shown flashes in Carabao Cup games. Um, people praised his performance at Newcastle. Um, 
on the opening game of the season. I didn't think he was great. I thought he was all right. Um, but for me, Bukayo Saka's overtaken him because the difference is when Bukayo Saka's had the opportunities, he's grabbed them with both hands. And I'm a little bit worried about Reese Nelson. I know it was just a brief cameo role, but there are signs that maybe he's not as advanced as maybe some people thought. And so for me, you know, I'm I'm perfectly OK with Bukayo Saka sort of overtaking him in the stakes. Set pieces. Arsenal's set piece delivery last night was nothing short of shambolic. It was terrible. And not just from one taker. You know, we saw various players taking set pieces and they were all just as bad as each other. And, you know, football isn't all about set pieces, but set pieces can be a great weapon. Set pieces provide you with chances, with opportunities to get the ball in the box. And, and if you do them right and you work them right, as we've seen from many other teams over the years, you can get a lot of joy out of them. But Arsenal just seems so fucking disinterested in set pieces. And you've got to question how much work goes into them on the training ground. But it seems like every player that comes to Arsenal, including Danny Ceballos now, loses the ability to beat the first man. It, it drives me absolutely mad. I don't know, um, you know where that comes from, but it's certainly an area that needs improvement. In terms of defensive uh, defending set pieces, it's an area we've got better in. I still question why Matteo Genduzzi was marking Harry Maguire every time. Um, I guess you'll say it's zonal marking. For me, it's a real concern. It's a real worry. Um, and I think we were slightly fortunate that Manchester United weren't uh, at the races in terms of set pieces either. And we maybe got away with it on on uh, a few occasions. Now, before I take a break and bring Jeremy Aliadier into the conversation, um, I want to touch on the Mesut Ozil thing. Mesut Ozil was completely left out of the squad yesterday. Um, he wasn't in Manchester. Unai Emery was asked before the game and he just said, I've decided to pick my, uh, this is the squad I pick for this game. The treatment of Mesut Ozil by Unai Emery has been nothing short of embarrassing, in my opinion. People will argue that Mesut Ozil don't work hard enough. I suggest you read, you check the stats because Mesut Ozil certainly covers ground. People will argue that Mesut Ozil doesn't offer anything away from home. Again, nonsense. Because when you look at the other players that Unai Emery continues to select ahead of him, you know, there is no case to say that Mesut Ozil isn't at least good enough to be on that Arsenal bench. I'm not having it. Um, and I, I want to know what you guys think about that as well. Because Mesut Ozil, for me, it should be a starter, let alone a substitute. He's not even in the frame. And Unai Emery clearly has an issue with him. It's an ongoing feud that started last season and there's no signs of it letting up. But it's a real fucking problem at the moment um, for Arsenal because one of our biggest assets, one of our most talented individuals, is being frozen out by a manager that, quite frankly, I don't have much faith in. So I'm going to side with Ozil at the moment. You know, until Emery proves us wrong because we're looking at an Arsenal side with fuck all creativity and... Um, and and if it was just because it's Ozil, then why weren't Ceballos in the team? You know, another one uh, banished to the subs bench. Another one with bags of talent left out. It's as though Unai Emery doesn't want to have that type of player in his side. And it drives me absolutely mad because it's all good picking three forwards, looking to use the pace of, of Saka, Bamiyang, and Pepe. But if you've got no one in that midfield that's going to pick up the ball and make that link between the midfield and the attackers, then it's pointless. And often those players are redundant and a waste, you know, a waste of a resource. And I think we saw that again last night in spells. So, yeah, I, you know, that's where I stand on that. Really annoyed about it. Um, I hate that he doesn't just tell us the truth. I hate that he just says he doesn't want to pick him in the side. It, that's certainly not a decision that's based on his football inability. Obviously, there is something more going on there. And, um, you know, I fear that this will end badly for Unai Emery, uh, more so than it will for Mesut Ozil. Right, going to take a short break. Um, and when I return, we'll be talking to former Arsenal striker Jeremy Aliadier, getting his thoughts on the game. And uh, we'll be, of course, uh, asking him what he thinks of our progress under Unai Emery so far. Uh, going to leave you with a quick ad uh, for my brand new business, which has just kicked off. Uh, AMS Media is now producing uh, the Chronicles of Aguna podcast and Simply Syria. Um, it's a brand new, exciting project. But aside from football media, we're also helping people to grow their businesses. So if you are a business owner, you may find this of interest. We'll be back in a moment. 
It's 2019 and traditional advertising is now a thing of the past. Times have moved on and social media is the key to ensuring your business or product gets the attention and exposure it deserves. At AMS Media, we can help you increase your impressions, engagement and online presence. We can provide you with professional voiceovers, produce innovative advertisements for your business, no matter how large or small. Across Facebook, Instagram and Twitter alone, there are an estimated 6.7 billion users. Our job is to make sure you're making the most of this enormous audience that you have at your fingertips. We'll help you stand out from the pack with our tailored packages and guarantee improved results almost immediately. So why not contact us for your free consultation now? AMS Media, at your service. Returning to the podcast is former Arsenal striker Jeremy Aliadier. Jeremy, welcome back, mate. It's been a little while Thanks, since mate. we last spoken. How are you? I'm very good, thank you. Very well, thanks. And you? Yeah, not too bad, mate. Not too bad. Slightly disappointed because I feel like that was the best opportunity we'd have had in a while to go to Old Trafford and come away with all three points. Unfortunately, it wasn't to be. Um, Jeremy, I want to start off with the initial start in 11. I want to get your take on that. Um, Unai Emery went with that midfield trio of uh, Genduzi, Torreira and Xhaka. And, and lots of people have argued that maybe that is lacking in a little bit of creativity. Do you see that as an issue? And what were your thoughts on the starting eleven overall? Uh, yeah, I do kind of agree on that. I think uh, obviously when when you see the them free, uh, it does lack a little bit of creativity. You know, like that relation between the midfield and, and the and the strikers. Uh, but he, he probably thought, you know, by putting Torre around, uh, that he was going to, you know, be a bit more stronger in the midfield, maybe put Torreira a little bit on, on Pogba, try to stop him playing, um, which I think he kind of worked a little bit because I thought Pogba was not, you know, didn't have a, a great game. Uh, but yeah, I, I just feel uh, obviously did lack a bit of like a, an Ozil or Ceballos when he came on. We saw the difference straight away of, of someone that, you know, Got that, got that flair, got that technical ability to just find passes and and create stuff. So, um, so you know, I, I can kind of understand, but yeah, I, I do, I do agree that he lacked a little bit of a little bit of of like you know, like yeah, creativity, flair, somebody that can that can affect the game offensively. Yeah, absolutely, I completely agree, and that was one of the things that you know, stood out to me when I first saw the lineup. Uh, Jeremy, what do you think is going on with Mesut Ozil here? Because for me, Mesut Ozil is, you know, people will argue that, you know, he doesn't put enough work in. A lot of people say that, which again, I disagree with. But they say he doesn't put work in and an away game is not the ideal circumstance for him. But surely Mesut Ozil is at least good enough to be on Arsenal's bench for a game like that. Is he not? 100%. Listen, for me, he's, he's 1 million percent good enough to be on the bench and good enough to be in the starting 11. Um, it's just obviously there have been an issue from, from day one between Unai Emery and Ozil, and, and it's an issue that hasn't been sorted. Uh, and obviously, it's just going to drag on until one of the two leave the club. Unfortunately, that's that's the only only option that I can, I can see because... You know the, the guy. The guy is a world class, like a world class player, World Cup winner. Uh, he's played for the biggest club in the biggest game. Uh, so I don't really buy the. He can't play away. Do you know? What I mean, I can't play away. He don't work hard enough. He don't work hard enough. He's you know he's a number ten. He's a creative player. You don't ask. You know you don't ask some players to do what they're not good at. So maybe that doesn't work for Unai Emery in his system, that's fair enough. I can understand that as well. That's, that's his decision. But then they need, they, need to, they need to sort it out because, you know, having a player like him in the squad and not using him, it's just pointless. You know, I just feel it's, it's just pointless. And, uh, and I keep reading stuff in the press that they might try to loan him out in, uh, in January. And I just, you know, I just, I just think it's, it's just bad publicity that we don't really need at the moment, you know. So it's just create create more negativity around the club and, and, the, and the players as well. Because, you know, players, we all, we're all teammates, we're friends. And then seeing how we get treated might not, you know, might not be a good thing for the other boys. They just, they just don't like to see that. 
Yeah, absolutely. I, I completely agree with you there, Jeremy. Going back to Lucas Torreira, he seems to be playing a, a slightly more advanced role. I know that sort of on paper it looks like a flat midfield three, but he seems to be getting forward a lot more and pressing a lot higher up the pitch. For me, that's surprising because he made his name playing in a far deeper position than that. Why do you think Unai Emery sort of adapted the Torreira role and do you think it's working for him? Uh, I think he might have, he might have, um, he might have started to play him a bit high of the pitch because I think he's, he's just got unbelievable heart. You know, he can run forever. He can go up and down. So maybe Unai just thought that he could, he could play him there knowing that he's got that defensive mind uh, and he'll be able to track back players uh, and still help and do a good defensive job. But I feel, you know, I feel if you want to play as a number 10 behind, you know, Aubameyang or Lacazette when he plays, you've got to have somebody that really, you know, got that, got that vision, can see a pass, can see a run, can see. And I think Torreira, obviously, that's not really his game. So he might get better by playing there and training at that position. Uh, I still think, you know, Ceballos at that position or Ozil are, are the best choice that we've got but like I said to go back to the game uh, of yesterday he's, he's probably saw the opposition and just for you know I want to keep it as, as tight as possible and that, and that's probably why he played him there but yeah I'm, I'm not I'm not you know I'm not totally convinced but I'm not as well against it I think in some games it's, it's, it can work out because you know it makes it a bit a bit tighter in midfield. We might not create as much, but at least defensively, we've we've got you know them three that can uh, that can do a good job and and help when when we've got the right back and all the left back uh, you know going up bombarding forward to at least cover up. So um, so you know I think he he can work, but you know I would not go for it every game. Yeah, uh, that's a fair point, fair assessment. Uh, Granit Xhaka has been recently named the captain. Um, firstly, your thoughts on whether he's the right man and the players supposedly being asked to vote. Is that something you ever came across in your career? No, I've never been, I've never been asked. Uh, I've never been in a club where the coach asked the player who, who do you think should be the captain. He's never been, you know, it's never been mentioned before. Yeah, I mean, it... I can kind of understand that a little bit because a captain is supposed to be the guy that represent, you know, the team, represent the squad, and if that's what the players thought they could relate to, uh, then I can I can understand that system. What I can't really get is is how long do how long do you need? Yeah, you know, it's taking ages, need, isn't it? It's taking it's taking six games before we find out that he was actually the captain, which I just don't think. I just don't understand. That's the only point for me that I just, you know, makes me think why you waited so long. And and it makes me kind of go on the way of him getting booed last week at the Emirates coming off. And then next thing you know, two days later, he's announced the captain. So I'm, it kind of makes me think, is that not kind of try to change people's mindset? Like the, 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 the fans try to help him out, try to give him maybe a bit more responsibility and, and give him more confidence. I, I, don't, I don't know, but me was more the timing of it and just, just waiting so long to finally say, oh, yeah, he's our captain, you know? That was a bit a bit strange. Um, but then, you know, after that, if, if all the boys and all the players are happy with that and voted for him, then then they obviously relate to that and, and think he's, a, he's the best guy to be the captain at the club. Obviously, us as fans, we might we might think different because obviously at the moment you know we don't think that he's performing as well as he could or as he should. So yeah. obviously people are people are just gonna stray away beyond well you know he hasn't been great so far he's made too many mistakes you know whatever how can he be a captain which I can understand that vision but at the same time a captain is is a different job it's not just about your performance it's about what you give to the team how you communicate with your players. Obviously, the relation between your coach and your and your players as well. So it's a it's, it's a totally you know different uh, different matter and different job. Absolutely, there's a lot more to it than than we as fans are aware of. Um, lots of people have been slagging off Granit Xhaka last night and saying that he ducked out of the way 
of that shot. For me, it takes a deflection. It comes at him so quickly. You've played the game, Jeremy, at that level. You don't have time to adjust there, do you, surely? It's very, it's, it's very, very, very difficult because it goes so quick. Yeah, it goes like, you don't have a second to think. It's instinct most of the time. For me, what, what, what shocked me the most was the before. You see all the Arsenal players running back, tracking back to get back as quick as possible to defend, which is brilliant, but nobody picks anyone on the way. Yeah. You know, and, and you end up you end up you end up with I think eight or nine Arsenal players in the box at the time where, where the shot goes, because they all run back to defend, thinking, yeah, we've got to come back, defend. Brilliant, that's great. But on the way they've left they've left McTominay on his own. Which is at the end of the box, he get the ball and he's got three yards to shoot. And everybody's just all thinking about running back, but nobody's thinking, hang on, who can I pick on the way and stay on it? You know, stop, stop the play. Which that kind of, you know, shocked me a little bit. But then after, it goes, yeah, it goes so quick. But saying that, obviously, you know, all I've heard on my career from all the coaches I've been, uh, all the club I've been, sorry, and all, all the coaching I, I've been with, uh, was as a defender, you don't put your head down, you don't turn your back, you just straight forward and you don't move. So obviously you can see that he puts his head down. I'm not I'm not saying that if he did you know leave his head up he would have cleared the ball out. I, I don't know. But obviously as a you know as a defender you're supposed to be able to to just take it up in your head, your face, your chest, wherever and, and clear the ball out. So it's uh, you know it's, it's kind of like a, a bit of, of a two ways. I'm not I, obviously I, I do blame it a little bit, but in some point I know how quick the game goes and and how quick you've got no time to react. And then at that time the position of your body might have been in such a way that he couldn't he couldn't he couldn't get his, his body up and, and his head up. I, I don't know. You know it's just unless you're on the pitch at that particular time and and do the action it's very difficult for her to to really judge you know it's it's, it's it goes in the split of a second so it's uh it's it's tough yeah it, i mean i i get what people are saying about the the head down thing but for me i, I just think like if, if it's a goalkeeper for example if you're talking about a goalkeeper and who is of course further back has more time to see what's going on and a goalkeeper sort of shifts to go one way and then the ball deflects and it goes the other. You're not really going to sit there and say, oh, you know, the goalkeeper failed to adjust. And I, I just think because it deflects off Socrates, because Xhaka's view is somewhat obscured by the defender, I just think, you know, you could say, I think you're right when you say he shouldn't really put his head down, but I think it's overly harsh. And I think it's a, a group of Arsenal fans in particular who have it in for Granit Xhaka are using this as an excuse to to have another kick at him. That's that's just how I see it. I don't know. Yeah, uh, yeah no, listen, you, you're right there. You know, if, if, he, if, he was, if he was someone else, you know, people would have probably not even mentioned it. It's because it's obviously Xhaka and, and that fans are turning against him at the moment. So, so that's obviously doesn't help his cause because by doing, you know, something that could be judged as being a bit of a mistake defensively, then, you know, the fans are not going to give him a, give him a chance about it that's for sure but yeah I, listen i just i just think it is a bit harsh to to get on him you know so often and but you know as as fan you just want your 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 player that are starting 11 now because he plays every game and now that he's the captain you kind of imagine they will be starting every game you just you just want more from them don't you you just want them to perform at a top level every, you know week in week out and uh and and sometimes I, I do feel that he does he does make silly mistakes. So yeah. um, you know, so I can, you know, I can understand fans that get frustrated, and I can understand uh, obviously, you know, uh, fans that are not booing, but that obviously, uh, you know, showing that this, the disappointment. Yeah, no, absolutely, that's that's fair. Um, Nicola Pepe is another player who. You know, there's been a lot of scrutiny on lately. He came in for a hefty transfer fee, which is, of course, not his fault. Um, that's what Arsenal were willing to pay to secure his services. But what have you made of Pepe's performances so far? He needs to improve, doesn't he? 
he does. Yeah, massively. I think he does need to improve. And and the problem that that we've got in this modern football is that the the price tag that goes with them guys are just so huge that we 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 always relate it to 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 let's say the the era when I played where. Thierry Henry got bought for 10 million or 11 million. Do you know what I mean? And then straight away, you just kind of relate the prices to that. And then you just think, hang on a minute, you know, like, this is not, but this is modern football. This is how it goes. So obviously you've got to try to not, to not uh, relate the player to the price he got bought for, because that's the wrong thing to do. You know, you've just got to try to obviously, be as positive of, as possible because the, the kid just obviously arrived at the end of the day. You know, he's only had a few games. It takes a long time. He comes from League One as well, which I've played in, which is a completely different league, you know, a different level. Uh, not as much as intensity. The tempo of the game is much slower. Um, but saying now, obviously, yeah, it's, it's not... You know, it, we expected more from him. You know, we've expected more uh, creative hand in hand product. You know, we haven't seen any goal, just a penalty. We haven't seen any assist. And and to be honest, I haven't seen uh, him gain close to that anyway. You know, I don't see him really creating a lot of chances, like getting in position to, uh, in shooting position. Or, you know, I just don't really... I see a guy that technically is... is got good ability that is good he can dribble he's fast but I don't feel that he's used his full potential at the moment I just feel he's still he's still thinking a bit too much and worrying about you know maybe maybe his price tag maybe a bit too much pressure for him at the moment yeah do you think that uh, well, what I've been surprised by is his he's he's not willing to take on players and I when I looked at Nicola Pepe before we signed him and admittedly I don't watch much of Ligue 1. I'd seen some highlights, seen a few European games here and there. I expected him to be more sort of aggressive in the way that he attacks players to try and take on the fullbacks and use his pace and then cut into... But he just seems like he he's not... Is that a lack of confidence that that may be why he doesn't uh, want to do that? I think he is. I think I think he's definitely a lack of confidence because I, I, when, I when I saw him coming on the first game at Newcastle, I actually actually saw more of that then him taking the ball trying to dribble players and, and create something and the more game goes by and he doesn't score and, and doesn't do what we kind of expect from him the less he, the less he try I feel I feel that it's a massive yeah massive lack of confidence and and um, and I think he's yeah obviously you can see the guy's talented you can see he's got you know he's got unbelievable pace and, and technical ability and stuff to to take on players but I just think in his head at the moment he's just yeah just such a lack of confidence and lack of of belief that he can actually do it that he's just play safe all the time you know it's kind of like he gets back on his left foot try to find a pass and and I say it doesn't yeah it doesn't try to to do more and try to go on and take on two three players you know many times when we've got when you get the ball in counter attack he's got the space so it's not like we're playing against a, a smaller team at home where they're all defending and where it's difficult to find the space but like yesterday many times we go in counter attack and and he's got the he's got the pace he's got the space to do something but he just just doesn't doesn't hesitate, you know. Doesn't he? Yeah. yeah, he hesitates to 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 go for it. He always try to to play safe, you know, try to give the pass to someone else to kind of take the responsibility, which you know you 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 want him to do that. You know, you want him not to to just you know believe in himself that he can he can achieve you know what we all hoping. Absolutely, absolutely. And Jeremy, just finally, final question. I want to talk to you about Unai Emery because of late the opinion on Unai Emery has been split. Um, I'm somebody who was quite critical of him early on and not because I don't want him to succeed and not because, you know, I want him sacked or anything like that. But when he first came in, we had that, you know, 22 game on beat and run, which in my opinion papered over a lot of cracks. Um, and, and, you know, people got excited but for me, there were still fundamental flaws in this team that have not been addressed. And we're now, I think, 45 or so games into his 
Premier League tenure. In your eyes, has there been enough improvement under Unai Emery? Uh, it's, it's, it's tough to say because I've, I've seen improvement in some games pretty much at the beginning last year. I saw a different team from what from what uh, Arsene Wenger had, you know, the previous year. I saw I saw a different uh, mindset. I saw a different attitude. I saw player fitter. I saw player pressing high, uh, higher of the pitch. I saw all that at the beginning for for a good period of time, and and that's when I, I, I was really excited. I really thought, oh God, we're gonna we we on for something good there. And and I don't really know what happened. That all that just just went out the window. It kind of all all gone pear shaped really. It's just like we've stopped pressing high. We we've kind of become what we were before. So so you know defensively still still problems. Um, obviously we do now play from the back much more than we used to do. I'll say. Uh, but that, I would not put that on, on Unai Emery because I just I still think players got to take responsibility for that. You know, I still think, uh, you know, every manager now wants to play pretty good football and pass and pass and move and one, two is play from the back and all that kind of football. But you know, at, at, at some point you just can't do that. You've just got to, you've just got to change and and hit it long and and play a different way. But that's that's different. But yeah, no, I, I just. I'm starting to kind of my mind's starting to kind of change because I just don't I just you know I thought I saw an improvement like I said last season at the beginning for quite a good period of time, then then we had that that bad spell when when we kept changing system when we kept changing defenders when we didn't know really what to do and we, that's when in my opinion that we've lost our fourth place last year yeah and since and since then we kind of still doing the same thing. You know, new player came in, but we 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 just not. I don't know. We just obviously listen. As we can't just blame the defenders for the for the defend defending problems because I think you know the midfield are related to that. So so as the Absolutely. forward, I think you you defend as a team, you attack as a team. So it's all you know. It's all about positioning and and about team shape. From my in my opinion, um, and I just think he hasn't saw saw that problem yet. And until we get strong at the back and 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 very organized. I just feel it's just going to be a, an up and down season. Some games it's going to work in your favor, and then you're just going to have them free up front, scoring goals and creating chances, and and that's the the rhythm of the game that's going to take you to a win. And some other games where you're just not going to have that, and then it's going to be the opposite. And then defensively, we're just going to be all out of shape, and then we're just going to concede goals. So. It's kind of like you just don't really know, which is the the worry thing about it. You know, you just feel you feel like yesterday. I, I went up there, I went up to Manchester, really feeling optimistic about the game, feeling that now we're going to do it. It was the best time to take on Man United, and then at the end of the game, I just was disappointed, you know, because I just didn't see what I kind of expected. So it's kind of frustrating because. You just you just don't really know, you know, from week to week. You just don't know. You don't see the same, the same team, the same desire, the same organization, you know. And, and it's yeah, it's a bit frustrating and disappointing. So, I think I think he's got the, the he's got the the experience and the pedigree to to show us and tell us that he's won stuff in the mm-hmm. past. He's managed big clubs, so you know. It, He's a top. He's a top coach and he's a top manager. But does he work at the moment for us? I'm not. I'm not so sure. Yeah. No. I think you're absolutely right. It's it's so up and down. Um. You know. I hate to think what position we would be in without somebody like Aubameyang up front now, because he for me is dragging us through. Um. Time and oh. time again. He's. I heard something last night. Seventy three appearances, forty nine goals. That is incredible. That is an incredible is, yeah. statistic. Um. You know, it'd be interesting to see, of course, how the the season unfolds. But Jeremy, thank you so so much uh, for joining me. I've taken a little bit more of your time than than no, time, right, so Harry. thank you no for that. No problem. And uh, hopefully, same. speak to you again uh, throughout the course yeah. of the season. Yeah, sure, mate. No problem. 
That brings me to the end of another edition of the Chronicles of Aguna. My thanks to Jeremy Aliadier for joining us on the show. My thanks to all of you guys for tuning in. Don't forget to subscribe, like, share if you're watching on YouTube. And if you're listening via the audio, please, please do leave us a review. It is much appreciated. This show is sponsored by The Last Man Standing with Loserpool.com. Visit Loserpool.com for more information. Sign up and play for your chance to win a thousand pounds. It's absolutely free to play which is, uh, you know, brilliant. You'll be stupid not to give it a go. Uh, so please do head over there, check it out, and we'll be back very, very soon with some more Arsenal-related content. Until then, take care. <laughs>